All right, we are recording. Um, tonight we are discussing chapter seven of Refactoring by Martin Fowler, um, all about the various encapsulation refactorings that you can do. Um, so like last week, I think we'll kind of just go through and if you have a favorite or something that was you know up or in question, um, go ahead and hit that off. And I'm not gonna lead off tonight. You guys pressured me last week. Um, so someone else gonna have to pick up that torch. Um, I vote for Jeremy since he's on the screen. So Jeremy, what you got? Um, anyone else want to go first instead? No pressure. Anyone yeah. else to gather my thoughts? Sure, I, I can go first. That's fine. Um, so the one that stood out for me uh, was encapsulate collection. Um, I know I've done this in the past, but when I thought about it after reading that that part of the chapter, I thought, how many times have I actually used this? And I can only count one time. Um, so I feel like it's not very frequently used, but I see the value definitely. Um, so I thought that one was pretty important because it seems like underused, at least in my experience, but uh, incredibly powerful, especially the, the whole discussion he had around, um, sure, you can return the collection, but someone can manipulate it outside of your class anyway. So you don't have much control you know, over it. And it was interesting to see how you can really use encapsulation to take control back, at least let people modify it in the ways you intend versus some other way. So that one stood out for me. I really liked it. Nice. I, I wrote that one down too as a, and so like, I think I agree with you. Like I don't, I don't really use it that often or I, I don't feel like I do it a lot. However, what you just brought up with it, like whole returning collections and that sort of thing, I do feel like I fix that a lot um, in other people's code or like maybe someone else has come in and done the refactoring ahead of time. Um, and I really liked what he talked about with, um, in terms of don't try to hide the fact that it is a collection, especially if you have like rich collection objects in your language or your framework or whatever you're using. Cause I, I do see that one a lot. And like, I end up, it frustrates me cause I'm trying to use like whatever it is as a collection in like a pipeline or in some sort of other processing tooling and I can't. And so then I end up having to either rebuild it myself, which I think the worst example is I've taken someone's someone's like object that can be converted into JSON and then turn it into an object and then turn it into a collection so that I could use it as a collection. And it's like, why even bother like making that so hard? Like we have collections, use them. Um, so I think that's really cool. And I liked what he talked about in terms of um, kind of returning read only copies or you know cloning it inside so like you you're at, you expose the collection to some capacity clone it yourself and give it to them instead of forcing that on them because then it's like avoiding the surprises that come with hey i modified this collection object which was referenced and now boom i've messed up something so i think i think his like the entire group or entire section on that was pretty cool i, I like that one that was my favorite too so no, I, I like that one a lot as well. And I was just thinking this, I wonder how much languages help us with that. And so, I mean, I completely agree with everything he put in the book. For example, I was thinking about Kotlin and Kotlin makes you declare whether you want a mutable list or an immutable list when you create it. And for, you know, you don't even have the, the, the add method is not part of the interface. Um, Java has a, a static collections class, which lets you do interesting stuff with collections. You can say, you can take a mutable list and make it and wrap it in an immutable wrapper by saying collections dot immutable list, you give it the immutable list. But to the caller, to the receiver, sorry, of that object, there's nothing that says this thing is immutable. Mm -hmm. It will, it would just be a runtime error. It will just blow up when you try and add something to it. So this, I wonder there, if there's something about language is not necessarily helping us. I mean, Kotlin does this really nicely, I think. Um, it is true. I didn't think about that, but yeah. I, Jeremy, I, you look like you want to say something. Oh, the Jeremy, or me, or no, Jeremy? I'm, I'm just, I'm just feeling out the room because I was like, "Is it going to be quiet this week?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I kind of missed the initial prompt because of Zoom being weird. So. Oh, it wasn't anything we, special. It was more like, um, I'm not going to go first. Y'all pressured me into it last week, so someone else had to go first. That was the, the whole prompt, so. Thanks, Bernard. <laughs> appreciate appreciate check you uh, the team, take, yeah. taking that one, yeah. Um, this chapter was kind of weird for me, I think. Uh, 
in part because it was short and in part because it kind of in the back of my mind I had Jeremy thinking of, or it was the previous week's discussions about like the here's the refactoring and then here's the inverse of that refactoring and I was like okay we've kind of got this a couple times now and so with like once we got past like the first half it was you know extract class inline class high delegate remove middleman they're both kind of like both of those scenarios which seemed reading it sequentially and he even mentioned this if you're reading this sequentially this is going to feel very familiar it felt like a little like yeah okay i get it <laughs> you know it's very similar like extract class is very similar to like extract function it's just at a bigger level because you're grabbing group stuff that belongs together and putting them into an object versus grabbing group stuff that belongs together and putting into, into a function or multiple functions splitting it out a little bit yep so um it wasn't my favorite chapter so far um only because only through the redundancy so i think like you know uh encapsulate collection is a great call out for that reason because it was like that's something that did feel new and felt like i like the idea of a refactoring that was you know kind of like outside the norm outside of like what you think about when you're first starting with the engineering which is like oh yes i should encapsulate this state this like shared responsibility into an object it, like is that extra level of like well you know people might still you know fully have it encapsulated because there's still like leakages in ways that you know your object can be used so i don't know it was a interesting chapter for that reason i thought i thought for sure you were going to jump on the encapsulate record like pulling arrays or hashes into <laughs> into objects i thought for sure you were going to jump on that one that's okay that's cool um <laughs> One that I liked, um, or, you know, I, I, like, I struggled with this as a chapter just in, like, it didn't have a lot of meat, I don't felt like, or I didn't feel like it had a lot of meat in it, but um, a couple of things I pulled out, so like replace primitive with object. Um, I thought like what he, what he said in terms of how you decide when you want to do that is, um, he said basically like whenever you are going to do something other than simply printing or displaying or, you know, just like a, a, what is a primitive kind of use case for a piece of data. Once you are doing anything besides that, that's when you'd make a wrapper for it. And he, like, I really like that he explicitly said, like, it's okay if at first the wrapper or the class that you create or the object you create is really simple and is just a basic wrapper around a string, for example. And all it does is like this one thing, cause that's all you need. Like, I, th I think personally, it's like, whenever I see, find myself doing something like that, I'm like, oh, this is a telephone number. Okay, now let me get country codes and let me do area codes. Like you start, what is all of the various things I could do on this thing? Um, and you don't need to, like you need to do one small thing. So just start there. Like the refactoring is only to achieve a goal. It's not to like make this the Taj Mahal of, um, the Taj Mahal of phone number, object, value object kind of things. Like, so I, I, I appreciated that point um, just as a call out. Yeah, that was the one that stuck in my mind as well, I think. And it, it, you know, I think it maybe speaks to how we as humans think in terms of like, I'm gonna get this bit of information, I can get this other thing and I'll do the calculation here, as opposed to, you know, I'm gonna ask this other thing to give me the result. You know? um, but that's something I think I see a lot, but, you know, that people seem to be very hesitant to create objects that represent, it, it, at least to some degree, that represent concepts in other ways. Like, you know, every time you see strings or integers or booleans being passed around as, as arguments to methods, it's, it seems to be a fa it, it often seems to be a failure of abstraction. I'll, I'll tell you the one that I've seen eight bazillion times is around money and pricing of things. And you end up with like, okay, so in this project, we pass along a currency prefix and we also pass along this integer that represents the money. So now every time you want to use it, you have to convert it to like be able to display it or whatever. So you, you end up with these five or six pieces of data just floating around in various forms in various places. And there's like defaults here and there. And you're, and it's like, how many times have I been like, I really just wish there was one, you know, money, just like give me currency and I'll just use it and I can ask it all the questions I need to ask it. And I think that's like the best example of this idea of replacing primitives, because that's not just one piece of data, that's 10 that get distributed in, and then you talk about like converting currencies and you end up in a nightmare, but yeah. that And that's a good example of the whole, only do what you need to do in your application. So if you don't, if you're not using like an external 
currency package of some sort that brings in an object. Um, don't try to build all of that up front. Like you need to do one thing, do that thing, represent it for your application, not for Jeremy's application. Not you personally, Jeremy, but. Any Jeremy, this is the, any, the, yeah. the platonic type Jeremy, which yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> it's the Royal Jeremy. The Royal there you Jeremy. Go. What else? One thing on on some of his on some of his examples, he was talking about like this very complex kind of like nested data structures, and, and that kind of rem, uh, maybe he doesn't talk about this because maybe this is not an official refactoring. But I was thinking about something that we spoke about last week, which is kind of like given functions or methods just what they need because it seems like that's exactly what he was trying to do like oh you have these nested structures and you only need like this one value three levels down so just create a, uh, an accessor method that just gives you that information but why don't you go further and like don't pass all of that crap and just give exactly what you need and that way you don't have to like have extra things uh and yeah maybe just because this is a book about refactoring and not about like other more high level architectural concepts. Maybe that's why it's not there or maybe it will show up later, but but yeah, I thought it was interesting that that wasn't part of the solution. It wasn't like simplify your data model, like don't pass things that you don't need. Nobody's gonna be accessing them or reading them. So why do you have them there? Um, but, but yeah, I thought that was good. And I also really, uh, even though this seems, this should be so obvious, but the fact that he kept on, on saying, always focus on the update. So when you're looking at these things, make sure that you first look at who's updating the data before you look at who's accessing the data, which is, I often do the other thing. Like I focus more on the gets because those are just the easy ones. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I thought those two things were interesting. I'm with you on the focusing on the reads. I always focus on, because you, it, I guess that's just like the perspective, like I'm consuming this thing. So I'm really asking for data. I'm not trying to manipulate its internal state, but that's the ones you need to watch out for. Yeah, totally with you there. I think a nice takeaway from this chapter for me was, um, I'm curious what you all think. It was um, sort of that, I think he really drove home the idea that, you know, you can just like, you just kind of change your app as you need to, as you like, hey, you get into this and like how suddenly this like delegate method doesn't make sense anymore. I'm just gonna like pull that back out. We don't need that anymore. Who knows, in six months again, we might decide we need that again because it's like more onerous to work with. And I, I like that money example because I think that's a great, I like you know, a similar kind of thing where, I don't know, you just like, if it doesn't make sense to you at that point in time and in particular, you know, I think maybe that's, um, something that's more possible to do in a, in a closed sort of application versus one that's open and extended. Yep. Um, but, you know, just make, make it work for you and, and for your company and for everyone else the best that you can at a given time. And if, if, the, if the winds blow a certain way and, and it changes, like you should feel free to be able to change it so that it's easier to understand. Yeah, I think that's a huge point. I mean, I, I think the first time I read this book, that's one of the biggest takeaways I took away from it. Um, and I think I see a lot of people who think that apps are built kind of like one perfect step after the other. Um, if anything, this book is, is saying it's, it's never like that, right? You just, at every step, you decide what direction you're going in and change, change the landscape around you to suit your current needs. It's, uh, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, for me, I think that, that that's so important. Um, it's, to me, it's in the same vein as the whole idea of, you know, the reason we write tests is not to check off a box or not to even, you know, say, hey, we have we have tests. It's more to give you that or to remove the fear of change, like to remove the fear that what you're doing is going to break something. And so it's the same thing with refactoring. It's like you're you're building up. And I think that's, you know, we've talked about like his, you know, kind of repetitive, you know, processes and like the very methodical list of, you know, recipes for how you do the refactories. But I think that all kind of builds into this idea of eliminating fear. Cause once you've seen that it is, there is actually a method to the madness. Like there is a way to, to look at it. And even the, the, you know, dichotomy or the back and forth of 
you know, inlining classes or extracting classes or, you know, the, that there are always that don't be afraid to do something because if you get it wrong, there's a way to go back. Like there's not a, it's okay. And it's, it's also expected that your understanding evolves and your code is definitely going to evolve or it should, if it doesn't, then, you know, why'd you write it? Um, but so like it's, it's the whole concept that we're removing the fear of change and embracing it instead. So we're not afraid to make all these even fundamental changes. Like this was, this was an idea we had and it turned out to be wrong. That's okay. Let's just extract the stuff out of this class, move it to another one, flip it around and we're done. Like it's, and, and then tomorrow we may change our minds and that's totally fine. Like that's part of the, part of the process. So yeah, totally good point. And even though this chapter was very small, like maybe that's the most magical part about this encapsulation chapter is that it is all about, or, or I mean, even though he didn't chime on it a lot, but it is all about that evolvability. Like we also talked about like, where will you take these temporary variables and put them into a function? They're so small, but it's, it's kind of like the same idea that you wanna isolate the spaces so that if you need to change something big later on, not only can you actually do it without affecting everybody calling you, but you can, you can also completely change the interface or even what he was talking at the end of the chapter, like you could change the whole algorithm if it's not any good. Uh, and as long as you created that layer of isolation, you can do that, so. Yeah, the change algorithm one was interesting and, and, and it struck me because it was so differently written from everything else in the book. It was just like, hey, if you want to change the algorithm, do it. <laughs> How'd you do it? I don't know. <laughs> Just wrap in a function and then change yeah. the function. You're done. <laughs> yep. I felt like that one was more like a kind of just showing you, uh, again, like removing that fear that, hey, there's this really complicated multiple step thing. Yep. Um, and it kind of ties into that split phase thing. Like you've got like this large clutch of stuff you need to keep in your head. So it's, to me, that one was kind of like the summation of everything. It's like you get to the end and it's like, I'm going to substitute the algorithm. So I need to actually employ most of the refactorings I've read to this point, um, probably to get there, but that's, it's okay. Like just start at the top. And so I, th I think this chapter was kind of, um, to me, it felt like the first kind of higher level um, that he was talking about. So he, he we, we got into the depths before, and then it was like very on the lower level of refactorings. And now we've got to the, what are the conceptual things that we need to refactor? Like how do we, and that's like where encapsulation data hiding comes in is, now you're talking about who owns what and like where does it sit in reference to other things and like should you be reaching into this object to pull the manager for the person or not or like how does that work so or the department manager do you need to know about the department to know whose manager is who um, that that kind of thing so I think that substitute algorithm to me felt like and it was at the end and it was like I felt like it was really brief in in terms of like you said Jeremy he wrote like yeah, you want to do it? Here's your motivation. Sure. Okay. There's a few steps. Just write a new algorithm. And like, <laughs> to me, I felt like it was more like a, like what he said earlier, like it's an exercise to the reader to just, you know, do this thing. He's like, it doesn't work in JavaScript, so I'm not going to bother with it, but uh, substitute algorithm, just do all the things I told you about already all in one, just make sure you put in a function first so that you're hiding the fact that you're doing this. It was so odd. I turned the virtual page twice to see. It was like, oh, there's going to be more. Oh, wait, chapter eight. Wait, did I click the mouse twice? No. I, I, so I, did, I did the same thing. I was like, did I flip two pages or six pages? This is the same sentence, right? Yeah. <laughs> nice. To me, that one was also kind of different. But I think the value in that one is if you've done all the other encapsulations, that's like the kind of cherry on the top. Now you can really optimize, you can improve your code without anyone else really noticing. And I wish more code was like that, where it was so simple. I mean, regardless of how you go about doing it, it's so simple to just plop in a better performing or shorter algorithm. The same behavior is retained. You have tests like you've done all the other good work and this is your kind of reward. So I felt like even though it didn't really feel to me that it was encapsulation, it's like almost like the byproduct of encapsulation. Yep. Like, here's where you want to be, where you can do these things so easily because you've done all the other work, you know, up, up front. So Bernard, you're saying like you'd be impressed if you get here and you can make this change on a Friday afternoon 
push deploy and then go on vacation for two weeks and you don't have to worry about it because you did all the work <laughs> ahead right. of time. That's that's the goal. All right. That's that's the life. I see it. I like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One other one that I really like, I mean, I, I really like the discussion of collections as well, and we covered that really well, but another one I, I really like was the replacing temp with query. And I think, I think he really leaned on JavaScript's get functionality to kind of obscure the, the boundaries between a property and a, and a, and a method in that one. But it was, the, the result was really nice, I thought. And again, maybe it speaks to the fact, as Bernard was saying, you know, that once you've encapsulated this, if your calculation for the the base price changes, it, it's trivial to, to to change it, and you know, and to know that it's it's going to be correct. Um, but I thought that was really interesting, and I, you know, it 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 did clear up the, to my mind at least, it really made the code clearer and easier to read. And I think to me that one, like this whole time, you know, the first six chapters, I've been like. Why does he have such disdain for temporary variables? Like everything seems to be like that's his first thing is temporary variables destroy them, like seek and destroy. Uh, but I think this kind of made the case to me. Like I just reading it, I was like, okay, yeah, it makes sense now. Like why he focuses on that so hard because it's like that having those temporary variables. Like he talked about the whole when you have them and you're using them in functions, your refactoring is your refactoring effort is a lot harder because now you have to ensure that whatever changes you make don't impact the order that the various temporary variables are, you know, like assigned values and then which ones are used where, like you, like that's, seems like that is the first step for him because it's the, it's the step that is gonna hurt you the most um, in the process. Cause you're gonna get into situations where you've messed something up and you don't understand why. Um, so I think this kind of made the case for why he's so, um, he has such yep. disdain for temp variables. I, would have liked to see this in like the first chapter so that I wouldn't have spent the whole chapter or the whole book going, why do you hate temporary variables so much? But it makes sense now. The one thing I think was interesting about that one is, is that we frequently think, you know, we, we can't do this calculation more than once. It's going to be waste. It's wasteful or yeah. it's, you know, we have to optimize for the last, you know, microsecond of performance. But it really drove home that, that, Optimize for readability first and performance later. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the, the calculation here is so trivial that doing it three times in a row that I think he doesn't the, the method in the end is going to have such a minuscule cost that, that almost no one would ever notice. I'm, um, I'm actually, I'd be curious to see like different people's opinions on this, uh, this whole con like temp replace temp with query based on background. So, like, I feel like my background is highly jaded because of dealing with like very highly database driven applications for such a long time. And it's like, you're, you're trained, exp it's expensive or even API interactions. It's very expensive to call and calculate something more than once. So you wanna do as much as you can in your database query or you wanna limit the number of round trips back to your API and that sort of stuff. So it's like, I feel like that background really pushes me to have a, you know, give it the side eye whenever I see this whenever I see like the same function being called multiple times, I'm like that you could just temp variable that one and use it like all the time. Like, why are you doing this? So I'd be curious to see like different people's backgrounds and how that affects their um, love of this particular refactoring or if it's like, if, if it's just painful, like I, I'd still, I feel like still, even though I understand now more like why he's so um, obsessed with it, but like, I still feel like I would lean towards not doing it just because of, it's just ingrained now at this point in my my life, you know. I wonder if partly it is that, you know, we we, we can swing from one pendulum to one side of the pendulum to the other, but the, the nuanced one, you know, is is if it's if it's a cheap operation, which summing two numbers is or poorly mathematical operation is, then it's probably not worth worrying about it. Obviously, of course, if you if there's network operations or database queries, then you know. Um, but even then, you could abstract it into a method and store the values or do something like that, I'm sure. You know, if, you get the benefits of the abstraction without the performance hit. If you've done all your refactoring correctly, you're not even looking at what the method is doing that you're inlining, right? Or that you're, so you'd have to go dig into it to figure out if you need to handle it in some capacity. Yes, it's, I don't know, I'm still, I'm skeptical of it still. 
I think I will remain skeptical for the rest of my life, but you know, it's just, that's me. You guys do what you want. Yeah, I think with that one, I think experience matters the most because um, you, you probably had to have done it poorly in the past to understand that you, you really got to have a sense. You don't have to exact count, but a sense of how much is this going to cost me to call, you know, two, three more times, especially with things even today, like modern stuff that people do and interact with APIs, like some of them, you have a limit of how many calls you can make. Like your employer could have purchased, you know, a hundred thousand calls for the month. And imagine you've wasted all of them in the first two days, you're screwed or you're costing someone money. So I think you need to have some experience in order to do that properly. But yeah, a lot of the trivial ones, you just do it. It's, it's, it's minuscule. It's, it's negligible, but uh, I feel like maybe someone first starting out, it's like, yeah, look, I, I cleaned this code up really well, but it's actually not performing well, or it's costing the company money they might uh, <laughs> learn the hard way. Uh, I have a funny story on that. There was a, like we were using this tool at, at one point at a previous job and it did currency, like it gave you currency rate, currency exchange rates. And the production version, you had limited number of calls. So you could call it like, you know, I forget like 200 times a month or something like something really small. And someone did some work, it wasn't me, but I, whatever, maybe it was. Um, someone did some work in there and somehow the uh, staging and like continuous integration system was started calling the production version of the API. So within like, you know, two, two hours or so we had wasted <laughs> the entire month's budget of, so we couldn't like get updated currency rates. It was, it was a big nightmare. We ended up having to switch providers to a different one for different contract reasons, but it was, yeah, exactly the, the case. So maybe that's why I'm jaded, right? It's like, I've been burned by this in the past. Like it's so simple to just call a method and you're like, oh, this isn't going to have any effect. It's just getting the currency rates, which we store them in the database. So surely it's all fine, but without double checking it, it's not actually fine. Let me turn this example on its head a little bit. Okay. What if there wasn't a calculation? I've, 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 I've been thinking about this a lot. This, like, I'm glad you all pointed this out because get base price. Let's just say the base price was $20 and there wasn't any calculation involved in it at all. Um, in JavaScript, in this JavaScript example, it just looks like a property anyway. Mm -hmm. And and to me, setting a const to when you could just call this just like the static value on the property anyway, it's like just seems like a wasted assignment. Um, but in other languages like PHP, which I work in a lot, or anything that like where you actually it actually looks like you're calling a method every time, it feels distracting a little bit, right? Too, because you're like, why is he calling? Like the same method over and over again because now you're making method calls instead of like accessing something that's just there um i i think i still prefer to have an inline method myself in that situation because it's it's not expensive to call a method to get a property right or am i wrong about that um but it 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 looks weird depending on the language yeah i, I wonder if there are two things that, that to me would maybe want to try this more. And after having read this, I was like, yeah, I should do more of this. The first one of which is it gives a place for the logic to live. So when that logic changes in the future, you've, you've already built a, something that, that doesn't bloat the original method. Um, and you, because, you know, we're, we're all, we all come with like, I've got to change this thing. Oh, look, here's the variable, I'll just change it. Like, it, it, it's, it's very hard to remember, okay, this is now more complex than before. I should extract a method and give it a name. Um, so maybe it's maybe it's future proofing, maybe it's speculative generality. I don't know. The other thing I, I wonder if, if if it does, and I'm going to play around with this, is just by trying it, I wonder if it makes you think about other ways of structuring the logic within the class, like other forms of abstractions. And, and this might be something I might just try and do more. And you know, the, the beauty of what he's proposing here is just just try it, and if, it, if it's not any better, just inline it, get rid of it. Right? It, it, it's it, so just by having that that other thing might lead you down a different path than if it was just inlined within a single method. I'm not sure. Those are the only two. I don't know if any, anyone else can think of any other reasons why this might be valuable. I can see, I think one, one other thing to keep it like for, you know, to keep in mind, is like if you're, if you're constantly like assigning to variables and like holding state in the caller, in the call side, um, you're, you're like, basically taking the responsibility for how you handle like performance mitigation or something like that out of the 
class that owns the data and you're like bringing it to yourself. So now you're, if you think about it, if you like took that example a lot further and said something comes from an API. So the expense of storing the data, so now you're like caching it, you'll end up caching it in multiple places um, a lot of times because, you know, different callers are caching in different ways or handling it. Now you've got timing issues of invalidation and all kinds of stuff. So I think it, it makes a lot of sense from that standpoint to always err on the side of, you know, inlining it and like replace, like always running the query instead of holding a temp just because now you're you're abdicating that responsibility back where it belongs, which is let the class who owns the data handle how the data is cached or stored or mitigated or whatever. Um, I, I think that makes sense to me, like from along the same lines of what you're talking about, Jeremy. Yeah, I just thought about what if someone purposely left the temp variable there because they knew there was a performance issue if they inlined everything. And then someone comes along and says, oh, I read this you know, interesting book called Refactoring. Well, here, here, I can replace this with a query. And I, I'm wondering how you would work around that. Like you almost, it almost feels like you have to write a comment. Like don't, don't, don't improve this code. Don't inline it. Don't do anything. Because that person, the original author probably did it on purpose. You know, you would think, you know, sometimes they don't. And I'm wondering how you would work around that situation where someone could be, you know, clever, come along and improve it, inline it, not realizing, you know, on a Friday afternoon that they made performance worse and they leave and things start blowing up in production. That's when you have those, you see those comments that are like, um, refactor count. And it's like, whenever you come in here and mess with this, and whenever you fail, increase the counter by one so that we know that this many people have come in <laughs> and attempted to slay this dragon, but have failed. Like that's when, I think that's where that comes in. Like, If you, if you have that situation, I, I would, be in favor of a dragon slaying counter um, at that point, if, if that's an actual problem that you have, yeah. I, that's not a serious answer, but it is kind of partly. I would appreciate it. I would laugh during code review. And, and, I, and I do think that I guess you you have to do that. Um, I, I don't know the example of the variable, but I mean, he, he does mention uh, earlier in the book that at some point, because of performance, if you need to make your code more performance, you might lose readability. So that's kind of a given that he gives us. So if you don't want somebody later on to go, go read that and it's like, oh, this is awful, let's start refactoring again to make it more readable. I guess you do have to give some sort of signal, please do not refactor this. This, this was nice before and we made it ugly just because of performance, because this matters. Um, I don't know, maybe companies are awesome and they give that context of like, hey, this part of the code is is very performant and very important for it to be performant. So please don't touch it without asking somebody else. Or I don't know how these communications happen, but but yeah, I, I do think that you have to tell somebody because yeah, if the whole if, if the whole issue is readability and you go into some very complex, weird code, you might just start pulling it apart and not paying attention to the performance thing. I wonder though, I mean, and I think this is a totally valid point. On balance though, how often, how often do we just not refactor and how often do we refactor and find afterwards that there's, it's introduced a performance issue? Like, I, I kind of feel like the not refactoring is far more common than the re doing the refactoring and realizing that there's some weird edge case. Absolutely. Um, it's kind of like the advice in previous chapters, like, you know, teams teams don't spend nearly enough time refactoring. Um, well, maybe this fear, maybe it's fear of that kind of, that kind of destructive change that stops people from refactoring. Like, yeah, I don't know. I would, I would probably, I would imagine that the thing where, like the idea of like performance issues introduced by refactoring of this scale is probably negligible in terms of frequency of occurrence, but very impactful likely when it does occur. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you just have to be mindful of what you're doing. And like, that's the, uh, that's the whole point of like the cycles of, of, you know, running the tests and like verifying it, don't just refactor it for the sake of refactoring. So that's like that whole thing he, he talked about of, you know, you're coming in there and saying, oh, this is unreadable. Is it unreadable because it's someone, you know, did performance tuning on it? Or is it unreadable because someone didn't care? I'm gonna refactor it why is are you refactoring it because you don't like it because you read the book or you're refactoring it because you need to change something in there and i would bet that if you're changing something in there 
you're going to have to deal with those performance dragons anyway um, if you're already in the code messing with it. So I think it would be safe at that point. If you're in there changing it because you need to change something about it, you, you the refactoring is probably going to happen anyway, right? Like I, I can't imagine that if you'd be in there changing it for readability that you would read a comment and be like, oh, never mind. I just won't do what I was supposed to be doing uh, because there's a comment that says it was hard at one point in the in the past. You know, that, I'm the one who goes in there and like sees the comment and is like, okay, get blame. Let's see. Um, when was this? <laughs> when was this comment added? Oh, it was by that person who I've seen a hundred times, and you know, I don't agree with them. So let me just <laughs> refactor it, and then you end up with, oh, I broke everything. Cool. Well done. Good job. Uh, one thing I'd like to go back to is about the uh, wrapping objects. Mm -hmm. So um, I encountered kind of several times some blocks that go to the extreme. Let's say, for example, you have, you're going to process an order and you need, you need a, a customer ID, the product ID, things like those, and those are numbers. So one way to ensure correctness is wrap all of these primitives into objects. Mm -hmm. So now you have a product ID object and a customer ID object, so on, right? Or first name, last name. So now you have first name, last name objects, right? And they seem to be extreme, right? Like you are just ensuring that the compiler knows the correct order, right? That when you put something, is not a string that you meant to be the first name, but is in the last name place, right? So I don't think that this book uh, advocates for that. It's more when we start seeing patterns of kind of uh, functionality plus data, right? Like the telephone numbers, or when he says, okay, it's just not for printing, we're going to do something more. So I like that middle approach, uh, but I observe in the code that I read and the code that I have written before is that, as Jeremy says, uh, we tend to, to not do that enough, right? We tend to keep doing these primitives because, okay, this is just uh, two things that go together, but yeah. So I like this approach of, kind of wrapping, I basically just start wrapping data and then you see all oh, these functions come together. So now you have kind of a real nice class, right? Yep. Yeah. And there are some also other kind of authors that says, okay, ideally you should not even have getters and setters for those fields, right? Because that makes those classes kind of just mm -hmm. some records, yeah. but you have the entire functionality there, right? Um, so, but it seems it also doesn't go to that extreme, so, but it's a good point to start kind of noticing this, uh, I don't know, similarities or these points of kind of groups of things that go together. And I think this is the main point of this, this chapter. Yep. Yeah, I think, Probably the most egregious examples are when you have like multiple obvious groups of data that are being passed in like some, I get a hash or as parameters or something. So you end up with your example, like you have, you have like a first name and a last name and you have a title and then you have, um, you know, a phone, you have a phone number and you so see you have all this stuff and it's like, well, we're all, we all know we're talking about a person here or we know we're talking about a company or something. So like now we have to know that we need to pass in this either set of primitive data and now every place that needs to use this has to pass it in. And then to your other point, like I think why we don't do this refactoring as much is likely, I mean, I would say it's probably laziness because when you make this kind of change, now you have to go update all the places that are expecting that data or building that data, or you should update all the places that are building that data in some capacity or provide some methodology for them to, you know, continue passing in whatever primitives they are then you handle that yourself, uh, but then that just leads to a bunch of weird mixed use cases. So you probably shouldn't. So yeah, I mean, I think it's it's good. I think the for me the um, like the 
the indicator that I need to do that is what you were talking about, which is you have something beyond just even holding data together. So like, I don't think that I would ever go through and make, you know, a value object for something that doesn't have any behavior. If it's literally just data, I'm fine with leaving it as some primitive form, even if it's not, you know, two, two strings, maybe it's a, an array of two strings and that represents kind of the, the primitive information. I don't think I would go through and go through the trouble of making classes for all of that. I mean, maybe I would, I don't know, but oh, I would, I would err on the side of, if you don't have to add some sort of behavior, don't bother with that particular refactoring. I like guess just my opinion. But in some cases, for example, in Java, right, you want to pass, you want to return three values, right? Uh, okay, you can do some, some triple, and there are some, some libraries for that, right? But then you have these weird ways to access them, right? Okay, it's the left value and the middle value and the right value, mm -hmm. right? And if you encapsulate that with a kind of small class, right, that makes much more the code much more readable, right? What you're writing, what you're returning, right? Because now the the consumer of that, uh, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to get the left or the first of this thing, now they are talking about a specific field that makes sense in that in that context. So I have found sometimes I do that and that makes it much more readable. But yeah, now you have to maintain another class. So it's kind of a, a balance there. This past week, it actually beat me that I, it was it was also sad because it was a missed opportunity for an, actually applying this knowledge. I didn't do the refactoring. And then after the fact, I was like, uh, if I would have done the refactoring, it would have made my life easier. But so what occurred was I, I passed this array, arrays are evil, don't use them, just use objects. Um, this array with a couple of values or, or a few values that, that I used to build a query to like a search kind of endpoint. And for some reason I was getting incorrect values, even though, you know, I was seeing there like, okay, I'm setting them correctly. I'm passing these parameters. I wanna get the correct value. So instead of saying, well, the way to fix this is for me to encapsulate this array and to actually put accessors to it so that I can just stop the debugger at that point and see who the heck is accessing my things when I don't want them to. Uh, no, instead I just went down the rabbit hole of following the logic and finally find out that at the very end, right before the query was going to be created, um, it was setting defaults that were overriding some some of my actual values coming. So, so yeah, it, it, it sounds like like there was no logic, there was no this was simply accessing the data, but just being able to know who is accessing the data, I think, is valuable in itself. So. I wonder, um, one, one thing you said earlier, Jeff, in answer to Antonio, you, you said something about if, if the, correct if I'm wrong, I'm paraphrasing, but if there's no behavior, you'd be, you wouldn't be that inclined to create an object. I was thinking about that. It's not kind of the definition of a value object, though. It just represents a value in a particular domain. Does it, does it have to be behavior for, the, for a value object to be useful? So I don't think so. Like, I think you're right on both accounts, right? Um, but I feel like value objects are mostly valuable, if you'll, if you'll pardon that use of words, <laughs> um, valuable to me when there is some sort of behavior or something I need to encapsulate in it. Like, I, hmm. I don't know, I, I, I just, I have a hard time wrapping my head around, you know, oh, we need to go through all this, you know, uh, ceremony to create this new object to literally represent two strings together. Like, it's, I often feel like if, if that's all you're doing and you end up with just like a, even a getter. So you've got like this immutable thing and it's just a class and it's literally just called person or just called, um, I don't know, whatever. Um, it's just, just called this thing just to have it to say, oh, I did this class and now it's hard. It's like definitive. These are the two pieces of data. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like that is the same level of effort as creating an like in like in PHP world or in like Ruby world, like a hash that just has those two things. You're still passing two values into something to represent these two things. And if all you're doing is just simple data, I don't like go through the ceremony. I mean, like I said, that's just my personal take on it, but I 
value objects to me are most useful when you have something you need to do something to the data or manipulate it in some way or represent it in some way where you're combining things or calculating things based on the inputs. Like I wouldn't, it's, it's more work to me to take like a, a hash and have these two values and then run um, like pipeline methods on it to get sums versus just asking like, what is the sum of those two to an object? So that's when I would, that's when I would extract it into an object for, for me. Like that's my kind of sure. metric. I was wondering if, if there's, so one of the things I was thinking is, is that we, we've all seen constructors that take five strings, you know, and the first string is the, is the title, then you've got first name, last name, phone number, and some other random piece of information. And of course, for a caller then, it's very easy to get them in the wrong order. Um, and those kind of errors, you know, tend to be very hard to debug. I was, I was thinking about that and then I was like, you know, but then of course you go down the other extreme and you're like, you know, you have a person object and the person object accepts a first name object and a last name object. And, you know, you've, you've kind of gone down way down the other stream, but I wonder if, if there's a little more of this, if, if you might do more of this when you're writing code that you expect someone else to consume, you know, you, you've got some sort of service call into your application or some entry point into some piece of code. But internally, I, I wonder if it's, if it's more acceptable to pass uh, primitives. You know, you're not you're not expecting to expose the inner workings to the outside world, but at least at the entry point, part of the part of our jobs is to make it as easy as possible for the consumer to do the right thing. I agree with that. Yeah. It's kind of the, the argument of like, would you? And of course, the way to mitigate like the the ordering of parameters is like with name parameter kind of concepts where you are able sure. to passion you know, that sort of stuff. But um, you know, beyond that, I think. That's part of the, you know, how, like, do you want to provide like defense in terms of you have these really complicated structures where now if you want to build a person, you need to understand that my library provides you with a name, a name class, a middle, a middle name class, a surname class. It provides you a, a tel like telephone and a telephone consists of a country. So now you have this country, you have to like, it just, so yes. to me, it feels like that, that ceremony of like having all these nude up objects to to represent you you end up adding a lot more complexity yep. than you need to like think of it in terms of like what you're saying like the the caller was something as flexible as possible so that's where you see things like basic builders um so like you're exposing the the concept of hey this particular object is represented by these other 15 things but instead of having to pass them all as parameters and like know what they're called you just need to know i'm setting the name so i just call you know builder build or whatever um, with dot name equals this or dot or error or whatever your language uses. Um, so like, I think that's where that comes into play to me is if you're providing a structure for a consumer that's not yourself, I would do it in that fashion rather than making it really complicated so they have to understand the internal structure. That's what it feels like to me. It feels like you're taking the whole, all the benefits of encapsulating the stuff into these objects and you're saying, hey, you have to understand my entire data model that's represented in here to understand how to make this library or whatever. Like it, it yeah. yeah. There's a balance here somewhere and I'm not sure what it is. Cause you can definitely, I, I, I definitely agree. You can go too far down this path and you know, what you end up with is, you know, person.create and it takes five strings anyway. <laughs> passes them to their object. Yeah. Your per person factory over here. That that's just, right. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Now you can pass you can pass it an object that represents a person, or you can pass in a string, or you can represent it as a comma separated value. And like, look at all these ways you can make a person. You're like, well, I just want <laughs> one way. I would like one way, please. It's interesting because I think after hearing Antonio, I think I'm gonna try and do more creating objects instead of passing primitives around and just see where it takes me. Um, it may not take me anywhere valuable, but. Even if like one time out of 10, I get something valuable out of it, it might be worthwhile. And in some languages, it totally makes sense because you don't, you don't have that, that weird scenario that Jeff presented, like, because a string is an object. And if your last name, new object still extends string, then it still gets treated as a string, right? So you don't get the whole, like, you're losing some sort of the primitiveness of it. You're just, you're actually adding value by saying, this is a last name, so it, it means more than just the string. But there is some other constraints that I can uh, that I can be confident that exist within this thing. Uh, but but yeah, a lot of languages do not make it that easy, and like it, it should be as easy as like oh, I'm casting this 
string as a last name and all of a sudden I get the certainty that now it has these new features, but um, that is not the case often. So it's just, yeah, I think it's language dependent. And I don't know if there is a language that is that magical. I, uh, if somebody knows of that language, I would love to learn it. But it's it's Ruby. Like, Ruby is the language. Okay, for. Ruby. Um, Wonderful. Just if, just please, if you're making a last name um, object, don't put validation on it that rejects like accented characters or that tells people that their last name is invalid if they only have two characters because that's just not a good idea. I'm just saying, like, just <laughs> please, if you're going down this route of making like very complicated objects to represent names, this is that's not the direction you want to go. Just saying. Cool. Um, so on on the inline class thing. Um, so he, one thing that I took out of that was, you know, I've never really thought about what he presented um, in terms of um, like you, you reach a point after refactoring that maybe the class is no longer relevant. And like, that's a good opportunity to then use this inline class thing where you've, you've basically whittled down something that used to be magnificent or something and you whittled it down into something that now no longer needs to exist. And so I think it's, I never thought about that that was likely a cause of like classes that end up being small or you're like, why is this, and, and, you know, hey, here we are talking about classes the other direction, right? Um, but like you end up with, why does this exist? Like, let's just inline it because now it doesn't make any more sense to keep this as a separate object. So I, I found that as an interesting point, just like as a thought exercise, like maybe you've you learned something new or you've abstracted something differently or you've changed how things are represented in some capacity. So you now, like, don't be afraid to inline things. It's like, that was, I appreciated that particular um, comparison of, of the reverse of you know, extra, like extracting classes was inlining them. So I appreciated that like as a just general rule is as you're going down this journey, you're gonna end up with refactoring yourselves into needing those inverse refactoring. So maybe that's why they're presented um, the way they are. So. Nodding my head because I agree. Nice. It's another thing that just speaks. I think one. Is, one sorry, go ahead, I'll tell you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, one example that he was mentioning is when you want to kind of reorganize right, the whole group of classes in a different way. So it seems to me like it was kind of an intermediate step. You put them all of it together, and now we're going to split them up. Uh, yeah, but I agree that just integrating by the, uh, for integrating didn't make sense to me. Also. No, I totally agree. And I, I was just going to say it just it speaks again to that mindset of the code should be able to change in any direction at any time. Right? That, that it doesn't always have to just keep going in the path that you're already on. It can, and even thinking that there's a path is the wrong analogy, right? Because there is no path. It's just. We should be free to go in any direction we want at any point. There is no spoon, that's true. Um, the inline class piece is interesting too, because I remember so last week we were talking about like inline variable and inline function, and it was it seemed like, well, why would I do this? And this is it, it was sort of like set the framework for that particular refactor then, because now you see like, oh, this is why you would do this, because in this case, you've done, like you said, you've been doing refactorings. I had this big, bold class and now it's like virtually nothing. And now it just mostly gets used by this other one. So might as well just get rid of it and pull it in here. And so methods and variables are like smaller versions of that where that logic kind of just doesn't make sense to exist outside of like wherever it's called. So just move it back into its collar. One small thing that I just uh, got reminded of, I don't know why, it's not connected to anything specific, but I really appreciated uh, that separation between the readers and the updaters, uh, because that's something that I, I think it makes sense generally, like if you know that we, we all know that we have paths in our code base that are mostly for reading and some other ones that are mostly for updating data. Like if you're writing APIs, you usually use the HTTP verbs for updates and patches and getters and whatever. But we don't, uh, or at least I don't, 
like do what he was doing, which is like, if I know that nobody's gonna be, like if the data is immutable in this scenario, then I just pass something that is gonna throw an exception if somebody tries to update it. And that sounds interesting to me just for clarity and also just so that I protect myself against myself because there is no telling how many times I know that I shouldn't be doing this, but then I just, some random thing somewhere tries to update a piece of data that shouldn't be updated in that path. And, and it just gives me another opportunity to understand my own code <laughs> in a way that maybe I just don't understand it. So, so yeah, I, I, I've never done that, but I, 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 I would like to try it just to see if I can figure out where, where are the paths that should only be reading the data or dealing with immutable data? And can I isolate the pieces that should be updating data and just keeping those separate and maybe even have de separate classes maybe, or, or a class that returns something different depending on uh, what I'm trying to do with the data, something like that. You're jumping into CQRS land, you're gonna be- right. Yeah, <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna be making monstrosities of, of architectures pretty soon. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Y'all do your CQRS, I, that's fine. That's, go ahead. I'm sure, I'm sure it works, great. Um, <laughs> no, I think it is a good point. And like, I think the, yeah, like, like, like what you're saying, it is cool to see like how you're, or to, I guess it's like validating your expe expectations really, like it's, you know what is what is the like what is the correct path and then what are people actually doing and like that ties back into the whole like i'm not giving you a collection but now you're building them and like setting the setting stuff and like what are you like how is like i've done my i've done what i thought is the way this should be represented um is this actually how it is being used or do i need to change something there yes very cool no one, no one brought it up, but you know, my favorite is the like high delegates um, is so like I I just want to like the the telltale sign that you need to do that is like train wreck code. So like if like this is my favorite thing to look for is when you end up with you know chain of fifteen different method or fifteen different calls that are like you know this access manager access this access department access company. And you're like okay, what's going on here? And it's like telltale signs that you have subdelegate. But the thing that um, like he talked about in that whole, in that section of, of the chapter was around like when you, you end up a lot of times delegating yourself into why do I even need this middleman? Like you end up with, and I, I find that I, you know, I do that myself a lot is like you end up with, and it's, you got the abstraction wrong the first time or somebody got the abstraction wrong the first time. And so then you end up with Okay, now I'm now I'm this one class that I have is actually delegating half of its stuff to this one this other place and half of it this other module. What's the correct name for these things? And it's like that's when I guess the entire chapter comes into play is you have to then apply them all. Um, so I think that that was kind of the linchpin a lot of times is you know you're just, the fact that you have all these train wrecks indicates that you need to really read this chapter and like go through and just like look for all these problems because that is. To me, like it, it seems like that's the whole chapter all in one is when you have a delegate like that that you need to hide, it's probably indicative that you have a lot of other architectural issues. So I liked that one out of the chapter. That was that was my favorite. Can someone just please tell me where my code goes? <laughs> <laughs> where should this go? I, I really just need to know. Nice. Maybe a bit of an aside, a question for me, but talking of this, this the, the method chaining and more of them that maybe think of this, but do any of you have, uh, so, so I, I've seen a lot of people like, treat inspections in tools like uh, IDEs as being things that you must always fix. So this comes up a specific example. I've seen a lot of people complaining about warnings about more of Demeter and, and they're like, ah, but this is, this is a builder. And okay, this is an instance where the tool isn't clever enough to, to, to determine that this is a builder and this actually is a real violation. But it, you know, people are like looking at this being like, this is a warning, I must always fix it. As opposed to this is a sign of a potential problem. 
do, have any of you seen that in the teams you work with and how do you counter that? How do you get people to look at these things as being information rather than I must fix all of these problems? Time. Yeah. Lots and lots of time. I mean, I don't, I don't know the right answer. Cause it's like, I've, you know, I've had this problem with, you know, what was that thing called code? code scrutinizer or something like that or there's like there's a couple of like code climate was one and then like RuboCop and ruby and you end up it's like a game right you end up you end up with this game like with your static analysis tools and like i think it's just it's just a matter of ex, you know exploring what you're doing so like don't always try to appease the tool like it's just because it tells you there's a problem doesn't necessarily mean that that the problem is an actual problem it just means that it is a theoretical problem and so it's the, it's the whole separation of theoretical and academic from practical and useful um so it's like i don't think that there is like a cut and dry way necessarily especially when you're talking about like ide hints because they you know are all over the place in terms of correctness or but it's just a it's an experience thing right you have to know how to look at it and say okay what is this telling me and then use what you were talking about is you know the context of well yes but this actually needs to reach into these things because it needs to build something or it needs to do it needs to know about these things and so I, I think it's just a likely the tools are going to get better um hopefully in theory they'll get better uh, but it's it's a it's a time thing I, I don't think there is like a right answer just don't believe everything the tools tell you because sometimes they lie interesting because i think so many people it's like jeremy said a second ago so many people just want what the tool to say to them put the code here and do it this way right they don't don't make me think about it. Um, not everyone, and I'm 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 obviously hugely overgeneralizing here. But no, you you can do it, and like like I, I, so like the worst I think the worst code I've ever worked in was built from scratch, and it like obeyed every single rule that RuboCop could provide, and like the baseline rules. So like everything that the community has decided. I don't know how how much you are familiar with like RuboCop in general, but it's basically like the community has made these standards. So it's not even like project specific. It's just the community has decided this is the thing. And so, you know, it does everything from, oh my God, you had 11 lines in this method. You must make it 10 or less to like, you have 37 um, dots and you, like, I'm making that one up, but like, you know, it just gets upset when you do certain things. And so there's, I mean, there's tons of ways around it. So you end up with, if you appease all the rules without just cheating and, you know, disabling the cops. Uh, but if you appease every rule, you'll end up with with a project that has so many layers of indirection that like even a simple getter is like five chains of methods just depending on what you're accessing and it it's it's a pointless exercise because it doesn't give you any actual benefit like there's no like working with that code base is way harder than working with something where there's like 500 you know 500 line methods every every five you know lines like whatever that doesn't make sense but you know what i mean like giant classes, giant methods. Like I would rather work in that code that I need to refactor than code that has been refactored to appease a tool because the appeasing of the tool ends up with, I have no idea what's going on because I'm not an AST reader. I don't know what's going on. Like I don't, <laughs> I'm not a compiler. I'm a human being. So I need to understand things. Like, yeah, just take what it tells you with a great assault. Like it's never going to be great. I don't think it's just a, it's just a, smell like it's a way to to point smells like it's to say this is based on our experience when we see this particular apps like syntax tree we think this is a problem that you have so you should do this like that's kind of that's how i take it is just experience wise right that was a long rant thank you for taking me on that journey um maybe having it in the ide is just the wrong approach like it's just anxiety inducing but i i, I have found specifically we work a lot with code climate and having it in the PRs does give you a moment to say, why, why am I violating the rule? And if you do think that you have to violate the rule, purposely saying one fix and putting a comment to why, I think it's, I, I, don't, I don't think it's bad. I, I found that often when I have to think about like, okay, can I appease the rule gods uh, and, and working through that process, sometimes it does make me find that I did create some crappy long methods for no good reason other than like I just wanted to get it done and an opportunity to abstract it in a way that makes more sense sometimes gets me where I want to without having to violate the rule and sometimes it's just like hey I don't know what to do right now so sorry I'm just I'm not gonna put a whole bunch of things in, in random places just 
just because I need to pass, you know, the test or something. So, so yeah, I, I found it useful, but, but yeah, I agree that it's not, yeah, it's not a game. <laughs> it's more information, just like you both have said, so. Quick, what's your code climate score? Are they still giving you like a, a score or a grade or whatever? We're, we're doing good. Well, we, I have a whole bunch of repositories. Some are pretty bad, but I think most of them, we have coverage over 90 and we have at least a B in maintainability. So nice. not too bad. B is not bad. B is, B is, B is doing well. Yeah. You're making the honor roll. So well done. <laughs> Sorry. It's not a game. It's not a great game. Cool. Anything else? Last thoughts? Last rants, if you're me? No takers. All right, cool. Uh, thank you all uh, for participation. I think it was a good discussion. And we answered the question of short chapter doesn't always mean short discussion. Um, so that's good. Um, I will see you all next week. We're talking about moving features, chapter eight. So thank you very much. Thanks.